I'm going to move this microphone down. Not that I need to, but I'm going to do it anyway. It was not too long ago, uh, here at the congregation, we, we decided that we needed to establish some means of helping those who were suffering so much because of the economy and the things that were going on. And we've always done that. This is not really something new in that sense. When those who had come by and stop at the office and need help, we've tried to help them every way we possibly could. But we wanted to establish more of an organized system whereby we could really reach out into our community. Times have been hard. You know that. Uh, things have been difficult for the families in Corsicana. So we set up this program on uh, Wednesday mornings from 8.30 to 9.30 whereby people could come by and we could help them uh, with food, of course, and helping pay their bills. And so that has been a, a wonderful success and quite productive. As of Wednesday, the visits to our benevolence program have been 1,982. That's pretty impressive. Now, it's impressive in the sense that we've been able to help that many people, but also it's impressive in a sad way that we see how many people are hurting. And we do see this. Families that are broken up, devastated, just trying to survive, just trying to get by. And so we see that time and time again, and it sends a message to us of the importance of family. Because as we've had the breakdown of the American home and the American family, people don't have that support system that they once did. They find themselves alone. They find themselves struggling. Tonight I want to talk about being part of God's family. Being children of God. What a blessing it is to be children of God. And what it means for us to be children of God. Our text is going to be found in 1 John. So you can go ahead and be turning there. 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to look at several verses in 1 John. Because it really seems as if this is a theme throughout this book. We see the amazement of John as he's writing this. That we can even be called the children of God. What a blessing that is to be a part of God's family. So 1 John chapter 3, start with verse 1. It says, See or behold what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Notice the language that John uses here. The love that the Father has shown us that we can be called the children of God. And you might wonder about that family relationship. How does that take place? How do we make God our Father? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Well, even in 1 John, here we're going to see many verses. Look back to chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. You see that? When we follow the path of righteousness, the, right, the path of truth, we are born of him, born of God. Uh, look at 1 John 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So you see the same language, being born of God. That we can't commit sin. And the meaning there is can, we cannot continue in sin. That's continuing action. We can't do that. If we're born in God, how can we remain in that sinful lifestyle and continue to practice that sin? In 1 John 4 and verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 
There we have it again. And notice its connection to love, which we're going to talk more about in just a moment. And finally, 1 John 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, for this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Attaching that victory that we're waiting to experience, that victory that we're going to have, not only now in Christ with the forgiveness of sins, but our victory in heaven when we overcome at the end and we have our home in heaven with God. And so there you see it over and over again, born of him, born of God, born of God, born of God. We are children of God. We are part of the family. Well, how does that happen? Well, we only have to look back to John's writings in his gospel account. In John 3 and verse 3, remember as Jesus was speaking to the ruler Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't understand that at first. Didn't know what Jesus was talking about. But verse 5, Jesus further explained, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. A reference to our baptism, being born of water and of the Spirit. We are born again, we become part of the family, children of God, God as our Father. So as we look through our text here in 1 John 3, we're going to notice some things about this relationship that we have to God as our Father. First, we are going to see what we are as children of God. Second, what we shall be as children of God. And finally, what we should be as children of God. First, what we are as children of God. Notice our text, 1 John 3, verse 1. See or behold what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. We are recipients of God's love. As children of God, we have received the blessings of his love. And you say, well, doesn't everybody receive the blessings of God's love? Well, yes, God shows his love to everyone. He extends his love to the world. But as far as receiving it, in the sense that we benefit from it spiritually, it's for the Christian, for the child of God. When we obey the gospel, in 1 John 4 and verse 9, it says, in this was manifested or shown the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's how he showed us how much he loved us by sending his son, his only begotten son, to pay that price for sin that we could not pay. Now, if you notice in that verse 10, he sent his son to be the propitiation. I know that's not a word we normally use. It's not our normal vocabulary. It is a very rich word when it comes to meaning. It is full of meaning. That's why it's kind of hard for the translators when they look to the original Greek to translate it to English. It's kind of hard for them to find a good English word because our English words are lacking. It's hard for us to come up with a word that fully describes what that means. But the propitiation is to pacify someone, to perform some deed to pacify them, an appeasement, a reconciliation, an atonement. All of those ideas are in that one word, propitiation, that he sent his son to be an appeasement, a reconciliation, an atonement for our sins. Now do you understand the meaning <laughs> of how bad the sins are and what we need and what a blessing it is that God loved us enough to do that. We are recipients of God's love. How amazing that is. Do we ever just stop to consider God considering us? <laughs> what God thinks about us. Now so often we're talking about what we think about God but what he thinks about us, 
turn it around. In Psalm 8 and verse 3 and 4, the psalmist writes, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? What is man? What are we? And sometimes we think that we are so pitiful, meaningless, no account, of no value. And so we see ourselves sometimes that way, but that's not how God sees us. That's what the psalmist is trying to express to us, that here is the one who has created all things, the heaven, the moons, the stars, everything about us, that amazing display of his power and his might, and he cares about us. What is man that he cares about us, and yet he does? And so that shows us that he loves us. That shows us that he wants us to be a part of his family. When we're talking about the children of God and how blessing, what a blessing that is to be a part of that family, it begins with God's love and how he showed us that love. But also we notice in this first verse that we are unknown by the world. It says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And so you say, well, what does that mean, the world doesn't know us? I mean, people know me. Everybody in town knows me. They, they know us. Well, not in that sense. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is the world does not truly recognize or appreciate what we have in Christ. Now, I hope we appreciate it. Obviously, as children of God, we appreciate what we have in Christ, the blessings, that relationship. Obviously, we understand that. But the world doesn't really understand that. They don't see it. They don't appreciate what we have in Christ. Because if they did, what would they do? Oh, they would respond in droves. They would be coming saying, we want this as well. We want those blessings that are found in Christ. Show us the way. What must I do to be saved? They would be breaking down the doors, coming to hear the gospel truth, wanting that salvation. But they don't. <laughs> they don't. Why? They don't really know us because they don't really know Christ. Our world knows of Christ. You could ask most everyone, all your friends, neighbors, co-workers, uh, say, have you heard about Jesus Christ? They say, sure, I've heard that story, I know that. But they don't really know him. They don't know what it means. They don't appreciate, they don't understand that relationship that we have as Christians with Christ. They don't value that. And often, they will even make fun of that. They will mock and ridicule us. Our society loves to ridicule Christians. Hollywood loves to ridicule Christians. They'll say that we are weak, simple-minded. That's the problem with Christians. They don't understand. They don't know us, and they don't know Christ. So we see that we are children of God as we are receiving his love, and we are unknown of the world. But what shall we be as children of God? Let's look to the future. When we live the Christian life, when we remain faithful to our God, we are striving to live as we should, setting the proper example to those who are around us. What's at the end of this process? What shall we be someday? Well, look at our text, verse 2. 1 John 3 and verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. 
But we know that when he appears, talking about Jesus Christ, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. You say, well, Russell, that doesn't give us a lot of information either. <laughs> and I'll agree. It doesn't tell us everything we would like to know. But we know that when he appears, when he returns, we shall be like him. We're not going to be like we are anymore. We're going to be like him. And what we have reference to here is that spiritual existence that we can look forward to in eternity. Now, if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians, I think when we look at something that Paul said by inspiration there, it helps us to understand what John is trying to get us to understand about this, how we can be like Christ, the change that is going to take place. 1 Corinthians 15, look down to verse 42. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. All right, perfect. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's what we want to know about. What happens at the end of this life? We've lived a faithful Christian life, done those things that we should do, uh, been a good example of those around us. Okay, what's going to happen? In the end days when Christ returns, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown, and watch this, a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. All right, that's what we're beginning to talk about. That what we will be what we're going to become is we're going to shed this physical existence. Get rid of this physical body and we are going to have a spiritual body. And you say, well, Russell, why is that even in this discussion in our text in 1 John? How does this fit in? Notice, continue there, verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now focus on that very last verse, verse 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption. In other words, this physical body cannot go to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This physical existence is not going to go to heaven. But notice, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We're going to be changed for our immortality. Now how do you like the sound of that? We will live forever and ever not shackled by a physical existence, not having to worry about the weakness, dishonor, this natural body, this corruption, that's going to be gone because we're putting on incorruption. We are putting on glory and strength and power. We have a spiritual body that will reign forever and ever with our God. We'll be in heaven with our God. That's what we shall be as children of God. Think about it in this way. If we're going to be part of that family, we're going to become more and more like our God. And even to this extent, does our God have a physical body? No. Does Jesus Christ now have a physical body? No. Spiritual body. We will have a spiritual body. Now, we may not understand everything we would like to about that, but we know from our text that we will be like Jesus, and that's really the key. 
that our lowly physical bodies will undergo a wonderful transformation and we will become like Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, we're going to look at 20 and 21. Philippians 3 and verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our lowly body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now watch this. Here Paul is writing the Philippians. He's talking to them about our citizenship. We're really citizens of heaven. This world is not our home. Heaven is our home, and we want to go home to heaven. And so he's talking about that, and he's talking about how our bodies will be changed. And then notice the very next verse. He said, what do you mean the next verse? Chapter 4, verse 1, because this is a continuation. Therefore, because that is the case... This change that's going to happen. We are citizens of heaven. We want to go home. We want to have immortality. Because that is the case, therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Because of this, stand fast. Stand fast. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Yes, there's problems in this world. There's problems with this physical existence. This is hard. We would rather go home. We want to be in heaven. But stand fast. Don't give up the struggle. Don't give up. Because there's something better waiting for us. It's all about that hope that we have for heaven. And that brings us to our final point what we should be as children of God. We should be motivated by our hope. First John 3 and verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This hope that John is talking about, that hope being an earnest expectation, that's the way we always define it, the best definition, that earnest expectation that we will be like Jesus. When he comes, we meet him in the air, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and we will be like our Lord. We will give up this mortality, give up this physical existence, and we will put on immortality, put on power. We don't want to live in weakness any longer. Well, because of that, we need to live pure. You see that? Everyone who thus hopes. If you're hoping for that, if you're saying, Russell, yes, absolutely. I'm looking for that home in heaven. I can't wait for Christ to return, for me to meet him in the air and to be ever with my Lord. I am looking forward to that. All right, live pure. Live pure. That's what it's saying. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We want to live pure because he showed us that's the life to live. He lived a life of purity and we are to follow in his steps. Hebrews 12 and verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We are following his steps, following in holiness and purity. The child of God is going to work toward living that pure life. You say, well, how can that happen? How can we purify ourselves? Really, we have to admit when we have a problem. Sometimes we are afraid to admit it. We don't like to think of ourselves as being weak and impure and in sin. We don't want to face that. We would rather not. But if we don't face it, it can never be fixed. 1 John 1, if you turn back there, 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. John writes, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But notice verse 9. 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to admit that we have a problem because we want to live lives of purity. Ephesians 5, starting with verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, we have that hope of being in heaven the decision now is to live pure to be what Christ would have us to be that glorious bride without spot without blemish 2nd Corinthians 7 and verse 1 having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God What a blessing it is that we can be the children of God, that we can be part of his family. And so from these verses, we've learned some things. We are recipients of God's love, and we are unknown by the world. We shall be like Jesus. We should be motivated by our hope, and we must purify ourselves. If you're here tonight and you have not obeyed the gospel, I would pray that you would do so. That's not one of those things you want to put off. I know sometimes with our schedules today, we can get so busy and we're trying to allocate time and resources and what have you. Sometimes we think spiritual things are the same way. We say, well, I can wait to do that. There'll be a better time later to do that. No, now's the time to do that. If you have not been baptized into Christ, you need to do it now. Don't wait. Don't put that off. If you are a Christian, maybe you haven't lived that pure life. Maybe you're struggling right now. Maybe you need prayers of encouragement. We would love to pray with you. That's what God would have us to do, to seek his strength. We would love for that to be your call tonight, that you need strength from God and the prayers of your brethren. If we can help you, please come as we stand and as we sing.